Order of Light presents A new era of contact UFO sightings and strange anomalies Secret space programs and off-world adventures Advanced technologies and new discoveries Extraterrestrial abductions and contactees Now is the time to speak as we explore the unknown, the uncertain, and unseen, we are the disclosure, and these are those stories. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a new era of contact. Hope all of you are doing good, all of you wonderful beings of light and source energy. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Dr. Daniel Seda. Now, Dan Seda. He was actually in episode 19 where he came on and he went over his own personal experiences and his journey, including an out-of-body of experience, uh, NDE, a near-death experience, seeing a light being in a friend's kitchen, and many other amazing connections within his spiritual journey. And in this, he wrote a book based off of some of this talking about a professor, uh, Dr. Uh, Charles Forthright, and in his first book, Chronicles of an Octorian Envoy, he goes over this uh, doctor, this uh, college university professor that has an experience that is quite out of this world, and come and grasp to that experience within the realms of academia and the professional science community, being a professor himself, and the struggles that came along with that. So if you're interested in that, go check out episode 19 of We Are the Disclosure. You can find in the playlist, the New Era of Contact playlist, and make sure you check that out. It was absolutely an incredible book and an amazing interview we did together where Daniel really went over a lot of his uh, spiritual journey, his experiences, and all of those things that play a huge role in his books. So, uh, Daniel, he's done a lot of interviews lately. I watched uh, you on Robert, a uh, typical skeptic, also uh, Sherry uh, Dive Bam as well, and many others. I've seen you on Lily's channel. I've seen you doing Alliance of Experiencers, uh, Diana and Aurora. I've seen you on Priscilla Stone. Like a lot of the people I've had on the show, have you've also done some interviews with them, and it's absolutely amazing. So, uh, Daniel, he has a resume, but Daniel's just like me. Daniel and I, our resumes could be a whole book and this and that. We don't define ourselves by these titles. No title in the human language could ever possibly describe who we are. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. And we believe this. But believe me when I say that Dr. Dan Seda all right, has an incredible resume backed up. And because of this resume, oftentimes Dr. Dan Seda is completely ignored in this community because he has something that a lot of these people don't have. And I'm just calling it for what it is. I'm tired of my guests with PhDs, my guests that work for universities, my guests that have 30 years plus of experience, knowledge, working for the DOD. I'm tired of my guests with the highest credentials always being dismissed and pushed off to the side. And that's because that's the narrative the deep state wants to play. They want people with no credentials to be the one leading the way and spreading the misinformation for them. So with that being said, a man that is beyond any sort of title that he worked so hard for so many years to gain, he's a man beyond titles and so much more and a great personal friend of mine. Uh, Dan and I, were really, really tight. We talk all the time, and he's always been in my corner. I was fortunate enough to actually get to connect with him at the conference in Orlando where we really got to bro it out, and you and I were so busy 
talking to everyone else that we didn't even really talk to each other much because we're both on our mission. Yeah. But uh, like, seriously, everyone I was talking to at some point or another, they would be talking to Daniel and doing readings and all this and that. And I would be talking to him afterwards. I'm like, they're like, I just had a reading with Daniel Sato. I'm like, I'm actually really good friends with all this and that. And they had no idea, but just the mutual people and, uh, you know, our mission to just connect with people and hear their stories and help them through whatever their experiences are. You and I were very much on the level on that situation. And it's such a pleasure to have you here. And before we get going into what we're going to be talking about today, Daniel's new book, which is absolutely, in my opinion, one of the best books out right now. There's a whole lot of people saying, oh, they got the best books, but let me be straightforward. No other book has inspired me more wow. than this book. Well, that's not this book right here. Uh, I just got done. You see the, the mold in there from my hands. This book is probably number one in my life, but that will be another video in itself. Not important right now. But this one right here has inspired me to a new level. And before we get into all of that, make sure everyone, you hit that thumbs up button. See, YouTube doesn't like what I'm doing. I don't fit the narrative. I'm helping everyday normal people and so many others come out and speak their experiences. When YouTube is too busy promoting nonsense fabricated fantastical stories of extraterrestrials off on other worlds. I'm busy collecting data and evidence that is happening right here on this planet. And because of that, I'm often ignored and just pushed off to the side. So everyone hit that thumbs up button. It takes two seconds. If you're watching this, it literally the least everyone can do. It takes two seconds and will help this video out a lot. And please hit that subscribe button. So with that being said, Dr. Dan Seda, how's it going, brother? Welcome to the show. It's an introduction. Thank you, brother. I don't even think anything could follow that. It was probably the best introduction ever. It's good to see you, Robert. <laughs> and it's always weird because it we talk all the time. So yeah. it's like, all right, now we're talking in front of everyone. Hey, right, let's get to the good thing. So Let's get right to it. I've wasted enough of everyone's time just talking about, you know, a little bit about you and some of the struggles we mm -hmm. have, because oftentimes people with the most legit evidence and the most legit backgrounds, we do get pushed to the side. Uh, the main narrative that's being pushed by all of your favorite creators that have over 100,000 subscribers and more, they're all being pushed by a narrative. Unfortunately, whether they realize it or not, there's a reason. The deep state does not allow anything that they don't agree with to get multiple views. I know I've been rocking with this. And unfortunately, Daniel and I, we've really kind of been pushed to the side. But the thing is, Daniel and I, we know what leadership is. True leadership comes from the background. We don't need recognition. We don't need the views. We don't need the subscribers. We just need to help people and help people reconnect with everything that is already within them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the greatest leaders go unknown in the background doing the dirty work. Am I right, brother? Uh, interesting perspective you got there. <laughs> that was very interesting. <laughs> we we do all the work and we just get shoved in the background. And with that being said, Daniel, today we are here to talk about Chronicles of an Octorian Envoy, a message of hope for a new generation. Daniel's second book in his Chronicles series, mm -hmm. which, as I said, I had him on for this one in episode 19. So if you want to hear more about Daniel's personal story and hear more about this book specifically, but in book two, this one really blew me away, Daniel. And it's absolutely amazing. And if you could, to summarize kind of a little bit before I get 
to adding stuff. I don't want to say too much because I want everyone to check these books out. They're amazing. But could you just tell us a little bit about Dr. PhD, Professor Charlie Forthright? Can you tell us a little bit more about the main character in the first book and lead into the second one a little bit? Sure, I think I think you've actually done a very good job um, describing it. But so, Dr. Charles Forthright, um, he's kind of your everyman kind of character. Um, he has some struggles. He's a highly sensitive person. He recognizes that um, he has been focusing for a very long time on that which he felt and feels he can control, which is his career, the the practical matters of life. Um, but I mean, you know, especially in the first book, he has that sort of absent-minded, relatively bumbling kind of quirky character and um he and and he was still academia yeah he exactly. he was in the system that's so important to put out there he was in the system he thought as the mm -hmm. system thought correct that is actually a very good perspective so yeah he really was the kind of person who he never really wanted to hurt anyone he wanted to make sure that i don't i guess following the rules to some degree but but um but always feeling um, like an outcast, kind of like um, uh, a little strange. And um, all he really ever wanted kind of deep down was to just find some kind of connection that could make him feel more at home on this planet. Now, um, in the first book, uh, he is your typical professor and he's doing his job, he's doing his life, he's living his you know, relative nine to fiver, but he keeps experiencing these very strange uh, anomalies. And um, luckily I have my PhD in transpersonal psychology. So I utilized a lot of interesting um, scientific uh, research and evidence about psi related phenomena within the book, which was really cool. Cause if you talk to any psychology kind of PhD person or psi, um, psi degree person, they tend to, um, they're heavily focused on kind of clinical pathology, but transpersonal psychology at its very core brings us sort of out of cognitive faculties alone as descriptors of pure human behavior, whether that be neuroscientific, cognitive, whatever. I'm not going to get on the academic train right now, but um, transpersonal psychology does put validity back into the individual uh, with regards to their anomalous experiences. So for instance, if you went into a regular, you know, psychology session and you said, hey, hey doc or whatever, I'm, um, I feel like um, I'm talking with my grandmother um, and she passed away a few years ago, automatically a trained psychologist would be a little concerned about that. But a transpersonal scholar would sit there and go, tell me, tell me what occurred, tell me what your experiences were. Um, and they would continue to probe that to gather more data and to give it time and to feel things sort of somatically and, and data achieve. yeah most important mm -hmm. oftentimes yeah. the science community comes to a conclusion before all mm. of the data is accumulated yeah and they just want to prove their hypothesis yeah so you have to be very careful because the scientific method is really all about continuing to ask those questions and to continue to come to some further degree of truth as objective as possible given certain scientific standards so i don't want to get too heady but um, no get heavy brother <laughs> all right, oh thousand cool. pounds let's go <laughs> um it was really cool and i'm going to say this to your audience because many of them i know and i love them very much um I sat down and wrote this book. I had no blueprint. I had no idea what I was doing. I just was basically, I was answering a call from my guides and I just showed up. And that's basically all we can do, especially if those of us who are very in line with our missions is you just show up and you be a presence. And my presence just sat down on, on a, um, on a beautiful little sofa kind of thing. And I just, I just wrote. Granted, it wasn't the most ergonomic of situations, but I still wrote. I had my little blanket and everything. And I was just, you know, sometimes, and you know this as a creative person, when you get in this creative flow and you just can't stop, you don't really care if you've had lunch or whatever, you just keep going and going because you feel this burning desire that needs to come forth. Well, that's kind of what I was doing for 20 days. Now, granted, 
you know, my Virgo moon, like I say this a lot, I did have to have some structure. I did um, put in there, I would um, at least go for a walk every day, but I would let the I would let the creative juices flow. And when there was a stoppage, I felt I then went out and did what I needed to do, but just kind of taking care of myself. So I'm trying to push me aside a little bit and getting a little bit more back to what you were asking before, which is talking about Dr. Charles Forthright. So Dr. Forthright towards, um, towards kind of the middle of the first book, there were experiences that he could not um, explain away any longer. He couldn't avoid them because they were literally sort of pushing into his um, his realistic purview. And he just couldn't uh, look away anymore because it got to the point where it was just right in his face. And so he was at- the, For example, yeah. his, you know, uh, without saying too much, his father mm. being in the military and involved with some other things and information that came to light right in front of him. And, and it was funny because he, he, you're exactly right. Um, his, his father was in the military, but that's really all he knew. And um, there's things that occur later on that brings more, um, more understanding to mm -hmm. all of their experiences. But as a reader, you would never even guess it because it's just what occurred during the writing process was complete revelation and unraveling of so many paradigms. I'll just speak for myself. I was talking to my editor, editor <laughs> during the process going, guess what? This person related to this, this person did this. And it all just came, came, came full circle. I didn't hardly have to do any big editing. Many times when people write books, you know, a larger editor takes things, you know, puts it around, says, develop more of this, more of that. My editor basically just gave me minimal things, worked on grammar and stuff and said, hey, maybe describe this a bit more of that a bit more. And that was basically my editing process. That occurred also in the second book. So anyways, uh, back to Charles Forthright. Uh, there came a point when he just could not um, deny it any longer. And so all of these, and then once he accepted it, which I think is a very important point. Once he accepted the validity of his experiences, which transpersonal psychology is all about getting to that certain place, um, trying to continue to get to the truth and the heart of the matter, rather than just sort of, you know, blase, believing everything and or um, uh, denying everything. It's continuing to search for those, those truths and seeking that wisdom uh, underneath um, certain things that are perhaps a little hard to define or quantify. So he then experiences things that are completely out of his world. And I mean that both figuratively and literally. Uh, and he meets uh, someone and that being completely changes his life and gives him more structure, guidance, knowledge, wisdom, love, compassion, all these wonderful, beautiful things. Um, he He helps him sort of relearn that. Because, you know, if we if we take our sort of starseed experience, envoy experience, hybrid experience, uh, many of us have, have had soul amnesia, but there have been little keys implanted along the way in our journeys that we could not deny. And we have, I'm sure, I'm speaking to all of us, right? You know, from my lived experience, there have been so many times when so many people have not believed us, but the evidence was completely undeniable. And so that just painted the, the, the reality with which we live in so much better. There is always a breakdown that occurs. You know, for instance, take a look at it spiritually, I guess you could say. You know, every seven years is a sentient year. We tend to um, uh, birth or, or manifest death doors for a major change in our life, whether that be physical or mental or psychological, et cetera, emotionally. You know, your Saturn returns the end of your 20s. That is a big time when you're like, okay, the world is not necessarily what I thought it was. What are we going to do with it? <laughs> And that's kind of, you know, Dr. Charles Forthright is a little bit older than me. You know, I had to make sure it wasn't, you know, totally me and stuff. And he's a, he's a Libra. I kind of like, I kind of like the Libra character. The, the uh, scale, the right? balance. Yes. And I like how, you know, you're the first person I'm going to talk to about this, but it's important because, you know, we, we like this stuff. I like, I like how the way in which he weighs things and situations, it offers people the opportunity to see things in many different ways. And I think that is a really cool way to bring people into the conversation because that's really what it's all about. I don't want to sit there and tell people what to do. Yeah. 
great example to see black and to see white allows you to be able to see the thin gray line that yeah. is within the middle. This yeah. is called wisdom. Mm. And wisdom. how many shades of gray are there, you know? It's yeah. So Shades of gray. Oh, whoa, just put an R rating on this YouTube no, video no. right there. <laughs> but a uh, great example, you know, the, the shades of gray. For uh, I know there's a lot of older women that might be getting all excited right now, but uh, that's not the point of this video, everyone. We're, we're yeah. talking about wisdom and philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know at the um at the end of that book i sort of just sat back <laughs> when it was done and i was so floored because for the first time as an as an author every book is basically like giving birth you know again i'm a, I'm a dude i get it you know i'm never gonna experience that but this was your man baby. That was my that was my man baby. That was my <laughs> let's see my fourth man baby. I guess you could say dissertation yeah. was number one. That was heavy labor. <laughs> yeah, but you but there's tell something me about that. Yeah, there's something to be said about when one brings something into physical manifestation that was perhaps just an idea or something that is hard to explain, but because. And within this process, I was able to understand my own experience even more. And I don't know if it's just because I'm a crazy Gemini or whatever, but there's a lot within me that I've that I've um, experienced and that I that I love very deeply and that I I just wish to share and 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 give. And I feel as though I've said this before in a different interview. I, I tend to feel a bit like a, a receptacle of knowledge or experiences where I love being at the observer and just watching human nature and watching um, uh, the capacity of, of, of um, human intellect as well as human heart. You know, I love those little YouTube clips that are all about people doing compassionate, wonderful things that defy, um, you know, gravity or defy, you know, expectations. That to me is what I think we need more of in this world rather than, you know, all the madness that we see. But I digress. So hope that answers your question about the first book and Dr. Forthright. But at the very end of the book, uh, there's some really there's a really wonderful thing that happens and that leads you to the second book. So. Yeah. yeah. And everyone, if you want to find both of these books, go down into the description. You will be able to find a link to book one of the Chronicles of a Noctorian Envoy and part two. And uh, that's a beautiful description. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned in episode 19, just that, you know, academia mind, that science mind and finding that balance and mm -hmm. Charles Forthright, the professor, having these experiences and having that internal battle to figure out that wisdom of kind of leveling it really opened up so many doors to his character and mm. the possibilities of what would be coming in the future. But it started with that simple first step. Yeah. And um, you did an absolutely amazing job on book one. And here today, it's all about book two. So I'm sure you could have never imagined. But um, in book two, before we get started with this, you know, uh, for everyone that's watching this, a little insider's information, Robert Earl White, I am a character in this book. I'm a little rough around the red edges, but... The truth of it is is pretty accurate, and uh, I, I really agree. But um, I am a character in this book. So anyone, if you're really, really curious, I highly recommend you read this book. Now, before I allow you to go over uh, a little bit about book two right here, mm. all right, um, something I want to say about this book. This book was all inspiring to me. I called you up. I I literally knew like every little tiny detail. Yeah. I read the entire book. I spent eight hours and I read it all straight in one day. And I really, really focused in on it. And there was so much because 
you know, I'm in the fortunate position of knowing the author. So I see so much more in it than what an average viewer could ever possibly understand. But after I got done reading it, I was truly inspired, truly inspired. And one of my favorite things about this book, without getting too much into it, is the beauty. It's mm. about the children. It's about helping the future, not so much ourselves. On top of that, it's the message that everyday normal people, you don't have to be millionaires, mm. that everyday normal people can make a powerful impact within their own communities, regardless of who they are, their background, sexual orientation, political values or views, or religious views. None of that freaking matters. <laughs> and if you just do what the universe has designed you to do, you don't need money for that. You don't need anything except for love. Mm. And love is the greatest tool. And then to have that tool and to use that tool, you see all those children on the cover, to use it to help everyday normal children, even if you live in a small mountain town with a population of 300, mm. it doesn't matter. It's all the great work that needs to be done. And my character in this book, you know, really blown away, caught off by surprise. He nailed it. You nailed it. It's absolutely me. And I did not expect that character in the book myself, Robert Earl White in the book, which is friends with Jimmy, mm -hmm. uh, Charles Forthright's husband in the book. You know, I'm besties with you guys it sounds like constantly coming over eating the breakfast all that and um it, it's amazing it's absolutely amazing what my character does in the book i'm not going to say it because for all of you that are watching right now you have to read this book and i know that you will be inspired as much as i have been and this book has truly inspired me to do more for children mm -hmm more and it's what i went to school for and at some point i'm like well in today's society people are way too i don't have a place in our education system even though i went to school for it and i taught overseas i was a teacher for two years in the middle east i came back to this country being i can't teach anything my beliefs my values my morals and dogma is not accepted in today's society this book gives you the blueprint of how to go around all of that. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, Daniel, congratulations on this book. It blew, blew my mind. And I promise anyone, if you're a fan of this show and you love me and you want to support me, you have to read this book because this is a manifestation. And believe me when I say, although right now it's just science fiction, all science fiction with time becomes fact. You don't believe me? Watch Star Trek. You know, that's a good point. And there is a quote in the front of the book, if you don't mind me reading it. Oh, please. I'll read it right now. I love that quote. It's it. perfect. Mark Twain. Mark Twain. Truth is stranger than fiction. But that's because fiction is obliged to stick to possibilities. Truth isn't. I was yeah. trying to hold it and balance it. It was hard. No, it's but, perfect. Uh, absolutely spot on. And the truth, you know, sometimes the truth isn't as sexy as the lie. Yeah. And it is what it is. That's a beautiful quote in there, man. Yeah, so congratulations on this book. And as I said, it just absolutely blew me away. And there's so many different things in there. But without getting too much into it, because I, I told Daniel before this interview, I'm like, dude, I'm so excited about this. I don't want to give any spoil alerts, but it's so hard. I've, I've never read a book before where I was a character in it. And I think because of that, I paid attention on a level I've never paid attention before. 
ironically. Mm. But take me out of the book completely. The message in there is so powerful. And with that being said, could you go over a little bit about, you know, part two of Chronicles of an Octorian Envoy, which the second book is called A Message of Hope for a New Generation. Mm. So can you go into that? Yeah, and I just have to preface first, um, this might be a Mandela effect, I have no idea, but yeah. um, it's actually messages. Um, that's what the design was, messages um, of hope for a new generation. And I know many people got this uh, book with the message of hope, which is still quite beautiful, but um, my, my, my little, my little earthy moon did just yeah. wants to let everyone know. So I do believe that they're printing the correct version now, but anyways, that doesn't quite matter too much. Um, so talking a little bit about uh, the second book, goodness gracious. Yeah. So it starts about um, nine months after the last book ended. And um, let's just say, I'll do my very best to not uh, do any spoilers as well. But Dr. it's Char hard. It is hard. Dr. Charles Forthright has a, a loving relationship. And this relationship provides him the opportunity to um, really live his life kind of for the first time. Because in the first book, he was doing everything he can. I mean, he was hardly eating, really, um, because he was so wrapped up in, in his intellect. And he couldn't, he wasn't really taking care of his physical body. But here in the second book, he, he finally has that, that love and that, 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 that stability. And that, that important part of his life that is connecting him to the here and now on earth, right? Which is where it takes place for the most part, the most part. Um, and within this relationship, um, he, he's learning a lot about human nature, about the complexities of life, about support, about all these wonderful things that people tend to learn, you know, especially in marriage and, and in long-term relationships, et cetera. So it, you, you, you see an interesting maturation with this character. And uh, you also see kind of the interplay between um, these two individuals, regardless of whatever differences they might have compared to the readers or whatever. There's still this, these interesting parallels and underpinnings and undergirds of we're all connected and we're all the same at our core. We are all source. We're all uh, love and light at our at our very core. And those of us who uh, seek to to accomplish our missions, we we are always seeking the highest and best for all involved. And that's what the second book is is really trying to convey. So uh, we we leave off uh, the, the nine months after the the last um, the book ends, and the, their relationship is doing very well. And they they construct a let's just say a school, a school for young people. And the way in which they were given this opportunity can be perceived as something that is rather rather miraculous. But I will say this, from someone who has had a tremendous amount of paranormal experiences myself, things that I couldn't really fathom how it happened, but given the law of attraction, given the fact that there are many people out there that do want you to succeed, uh, that are not always at your throat. You know, we are, we are, um, we are powerful beings. And when our light is combined, we are uh, immensely powerful. So there was a need, there was a call that this character um, answered. And they, they begin to introduce that kind of call in the first book but you, it's actualized in the second book. It's actualized for the first time. So you're right when you say, honestly, when we chatted the other day, you said so many amazing things that yeah, I'm so thankful. And I have had some uh, great people text me and, and message me and say some similar things too. So this is really um, something that, that I'm very thankful for, not only for you, but also for our audience. And, and who knows, my... My crazy guy's making me write this stuff. But uh, within this school, he takes on something that would probably be a little scary to a lot of people. But he does it in such a way where it's so inspiring because it is possible. You know, you and I, um, Robert. It's realistic. 
is it's realistic. realistic. Yeah. Like what we actually can do with the resources we have. Yeah, yeah. And especially given the fact that he's not the only one with this mission, uh, there are many people who who are sort of put in place to 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 manifest these things into reality because it's so needed and called for. So when you mentioned the importance of the children, uh, I, I, I can step back right now and see how many of us um, in the community are really focused on that. I think that's a very powerful and important thing. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm 40, and this is sort of the time when most people do, um, you know, they either have families of their own or they're feeling this call to really take care of the next generation. I'm sort of midlife, I guess you could say, uh, mid Terran life. Um, but within the book, it's so surprising because as I was writing it, I was like, okay, so I'm supposed to do this thing. How how am I going to have these age group characters? There were many critical questions that I had to answer. So that took, you know, my research mind, but it also took my capacity to trust the process and to just go and to trust my creativity. Luckily, you know, I, I have trained as a, as a kind of an artist performer for a very long time. So I know what those inner workings of the creative mind and the creative heart need to be their fullest authentic selves. And I don't, well, I always preface, I don't mean to get too heady, but the creative process is something that is rather illusion, uh, illusor, illusory for, for many people, but still, um, you know, something that is uh, a little hard to define, but it is something that is our birthright. Our birthright is to be creative individuals, you know, and you don't have to look at it so as, um, you know, we're all painters, right? It's 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 different than that. When one is when one is bringing something forth from the non-physical into the physical, they are being creative. And so for me, I just um, a, a, attracted to more of the performative aspects of those of that creative expression. And so I was able to train as an actor and a singer and a dancer and um, a pianist, and all of those oddly enough at added to my wheelhouse with which mm -hmm. I could assist the process of, let's just say disclosure on my end, to reach more people. Um, preparation. It was needed preparation mm -hmm. for you and I to do what we are doing now. Yes, very, very true, my friend. So this, um, this school uh, is, if you can imagine a small town, how would a small town go about creating a school for a, a small hillbilly mountain yeah. town? Yeah, let me make that clear. Yeah, let me let me make that clear. Yeah, real backwoods. And I will be honest with you, uh, I do love research. That's just how I am. So a part of me got to a certain chapter, and I was like, okay, well, this hat, this there has to be a um, a logical legal entity with regards to this thing. So how would one do that, right? So I actually, I'm gonna tell you, I'll be honest with you. So I called, I called like the Virginia Homeschooling Association or something to just have a conversation with them. Listen, I'm, I'm being serious. And I was just like, so if someone wanted to do this, how would they do that? And of course, they didn't know the answers, but they said, we'll have our legal team call you or something and give you some information about um, uh, what it's like to homeschool in Virginia or something like that. So I had, I had the, the, the tangible, um, uh, answers from some people, you know, I asked questions that were quite basic, like what were, what would be some of the subjects that would be necessary to get credentials for this and that, right? You know, my regulations, little... et cetera. Yeah. yeah. And I found out actually, and I don't mean to incriminate anyone, but um, in Virginia, there's not much. So it worked very well with this book. And um, I was able to um, bring bring my readers into the conversation of how to put the roots down, put the groundwork to have this school be a real thing and to hopefully change some lives. And then from there, what's it like day by day being a teacher and a student at this school, being an administrator at this school, you know? So we bring people and we learn, there's so many characters, so many wonderful character art arcs and um, developments there that I think um, exposed a lot of real time 
um, experiences to a lot of people, you know? Yeah. And a side note to that too. One of the things I really enjoy, it's not like Harry Potter <laughs> Hogwarts where you have a hundred to 200 students in there. It's a very small amount of students realistic to, if we were to start something of this nature, mm. it's not like there was a thousand students or a hundred students. It was literally, I think, the first one, like, five students. It was yeah. so realistic and just all different ages. It wasn't even, like, one grade. And yeah. what you said before, you were struggling. How do I get, you mm. know, from ages 5 to 18 mm. all in the same room with each other? How in the yeah. heck do you teach that? Which I'm not going to talk about it, but guess what? You figured it out, Bob. Yeah, and luckily, uh, given the given the guise of a fictional story, there are ways in which we can um, bring more facts to the forefront and continue to ground the story, which is important, and still have some higher um, higher knowledge disseminated. Now, granted, mm -hmm. there are some conversations that occur when some of the kids are a little too young to you know, say some of the things they say, but if you take a little bit of that out and you continue to, to, um, to really uh, understand what the larger message, message is and what the larger story is, you just fall in love with these characters. And who's to say, because with all due respect, I've had great conversations with very young people. I used to teach, you know, I know we have conversations about this, but um, I taught at an after school. So what I would do, uh, this was about happened last, last year, I believe around this time. I think um, I was teaching at a, um, a liberal arts school in the mountains of North Carolina, a, um, a university or a college. So I would teach college courses uh, in the morning. I think it was maybe eight o'clock to like nine thirty or ten or something like that. And then around I think noon or one o'clock or two, I would drive over to Asheville to an elementary school, and I would teach their after school um, creative arts things. So I would go from heady college stuff in the morning right? Stressful. To then um, hang in with the kids. And some of the conversations I've had with some of those children, I'm like, where did you come from, right? Well, I guess we know the answers to some of that. But that's that was a lot of um, inspiration and hope within the book. And um, I never knew who I was meeting as I was writing the book. I didn't know anything about them. There came a point towards I don't know, maybe the maybe the middle of the book where I had to actually create a, a spreadsheet <laughs> and be like, OK, so what is this character's like astrological sign? What is their character arc? What is their weakness? What is their limitation? So I did uh, at that point, I did put some some of those um, important logistics in, 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 in a framework because I wanted to make sure I describe these characters in the way that that it brings more organic life to the story and to them because you know people readers care very deeply about characters um they see parts of themselves if you hear anything it's charlie he's 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 going nah, nah, nah. love him uh charlie my dog <laughs> and yeah so, not, not the character that charlie is named after that's true isn't that interesting so yeah, my dog's name is. my dog's name is charles you know i'm i'm kind of a doctor um there, oh, you know what's interesting, Robert? Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that really remarkable trifecta thing that you brought up before about the characters and their similarities kind of to the to the author. And, and do you remember that? So, well, yeah. I'll mm -hmm. so yeah, the, the, the connection, because mm -hmm. one of the things after I was reading the book, mm -hmm. as I was reading, like my character is me. And it has my name. It was really easy to distinguish. But Tell as me. I was, yeah, but as I was reading about uh, Professor Dr. Charles Forthright and his husband, Jimmy, I, I knew Dan and I knew his dog was named Charlie. I got what was going on with there. But yeah. some part of me, I was saying to myself, all right, Dan, like, I kind of see you as, you know, Charlie. Like, I see him as that character. But I said, Dan, who is this Jimmy guy? Because he's the perfect catch. He's, like, too good to be true. What's going on? 
I, I couldn't understand who these other characters were and who they were based off of because everything within these books is based off of your life experiencing your knowledge. Yeah. So yes, if you would like to go more into that, like that, that trifecta yeah. of those characters and pertaining to you as an individual, mm -hmm. where was the inspiration from this? Really good question. Um, so I just have to preface um, that they're actually not married, but one could perceive that um, they are they are the partners. Um, so so you know I had to make sure you know um, I'm always doing my best to make sure that my information can reach more people and um, you know some people have certain beliefs about things. So I, I did my best to just simply. They were in love. Oh yeah, I just simply... that's undeniable. <laughs> I wanted yeah. to simply show that these individuals were were partners and that they they loved each other very much regardless of their gender or whatever. But I just wanted to mention that just in case because you know. So when you mentioned that to me, I was like, I hadn't really thought about that. But as you were t as you were as you were sort of assuming totally totally fine that I was more of a ch of the Charles character, I thought to myself and I was like, you know what? I think Doctor Forthright represents more of my intellect. Jimmy Rose represents more of my heart, and Donna L represents more of my spirituality. And because I, I give a lot of credence to my team, because I really don't don't think any human could kind of do a lot of the things that you know we do and stuff in forty years or whatever. Um, I uh, I never wanted to think of myself as more parts of the characters than what they were because I want people to, to to find themselves in the characters. But as the author, I guess, I had to write about what I know and about what I know about being married and what I know about being in love and what I know about loss and grief and family and conflict and animals and kids and students and, and 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 because i've had a very rich life even so far i think that um i hopefully have done done that justice and hopefully that answers your question so and it's all reflected and you're absolutely right daniel after we had that conversation going over all the little mm -hmm. details and i'm like so who are these characters once he told me that it was, you know, different reflections, you know, Charles Forthright, that was more of your academia mind, more of the professor side of Daniel. Jimmy was more of that loving, compassionate, wanting to serve, uh, nurture, take care of, a emotional. little emotional and smart ass when you need to be. <laughs> and he is. He is. It, it's there. there and go. then mentioned which you haven't brought up before danielle all right which is you know your extraterrestrial contact in the yeah. book and that is your spiritual octorian octorians are known for being masters of spirituality throughout the universe so it's really the three in one yeah the divine holy trinity if you will and it's absolutely captured and reflected in all of those other things you mentioned, the love, the struggle, the family, the lack of understanding, the understanding, children, animals. It's all within this book. And one thing I want to mention out, because I, I see you tiptoeing on the lines. I'm like, oh, I, I just said, oh, you guys were married. But, you know, this book is so powerful. Not just this, both books, but in this book specifically. Now, I'm a straight guy, and I, I want to talk about this because not a lot of people in this community are willing to talk about it. But I'm a straight guy. I love women. I have a woman. I love very much. That's how I work. But when I first started reading this book, I was just reading the story and what Charles the character and his partner Jimmy had and the life they were living as a straight man it's everything that I want for my life right now to be in the mountains living self-sufficient 
truly in love, the embrace, the banter, just having each other's backs. I don't care if you're straight, gay, whatever, above. What is described in this book is true love. And as a straight person for anyone out there that might, you know, still be coming to terms with all that, although I was raised, I had uncles, Mm -hmm. I had aunts, a lot of my guests that have been on the show, I've had transsexuals, I've had other um, gays slash lesbians, all all sorts of people on the show. It don't matter to me. I'm used to it. So I guess people would say, oh, Robert, you're just brainwashed and uh, you're going to hell. Whatever. Okay. It's cool because I see love within others. Yeah. And I am no one to say that something isn't love. Mm -hmm. And what I read in this book is truly a deep love story. A love that transcends the LGBTQ community's uh, political agenda. This isn't anything like that. And I want to bring up this point. And I told Dan personally, I said, one of my favorite things, because I grew up with aunts. I grew up with uncles. All right. My stepsister growing up, she was a lesbian. We used to talk about the same girls as we were children, same girls we had crushes on. It was very normal to me. But what I loved in this book was you weren't an outcast of society. Mm. Your characters were highly involved into town meetings, etc. They were respected individuals. There was no victimizing. Mm. At times, certain characters in the book would have valid questions, Mm -hmm. and you didn't shame them about them. I remember the one point, I want to bring this up because it was so powerful. The one point you're like, what what should we call him? Mm. Do we call him your boyfriend? Do we call him a spouse? Do we call him that? You know, they didn't say that, but what should we call Jimmy, the character in the book? He said, "What, what would you call two people in love with each other? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like whatever you want. I don't care what you call it. It is what it is. And yeah. I just love the lack of agenda and mm. just the pure simplicity of these two amazing people doing great things for the universe, for planet Earth, for this little mountain town. They were respected, well known, and loved within that community. And they had a lot of questionable friends that <laughs> were in there, and it didn't matter. And I, to me, I just I feel like I have to speak on that as a person that is straight. And I know so many like uh, you know uh, certain groups have infiltrated the disclosure community. That sometimes people that are transgender or are a part of the LGBTQ community that are in this phenomena, they are pushed to the side. And that stuff needs to stop. Mm -hmm. And I respected that so much. And I just want anyone to know if you were to purchase this, if you are a straight guy, I know at first it may seem kind of like, uh, you know, Brokeback Brokeback. Mountain. <laughs> That's why I told you because at first they're they're in a mountain town, they're in love, they're playing with their dogs, life is just perfect, and then it happens. Yeah, and then your whole mind is blown. It goes from Brokeback Mountain to out of this world, mind blowing stuff. And I'll tell you what, it hit me like a freight train going a thousand miles per hour. I was like, I did not see that coming. I didn't know where this was going, but uh, I can, you know, confirm and confidently say that everyone, like, regardless if you're a straight person or in these communities, it, it doesn't matter. This story isn't about that. It's Mm. about love, and love transcends any sexual preference, gender, or extraterrestrial species throughout the universe. It don't matter what you are, because love transcends it all, brother. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Boom! Done! Political views, it transcends it. Love transcends everything that our governments use to divide us. Mm. It transcends it all. It doesn't matter. We're people. Yep. Now, um, I'm actually going to be doing an interview. I think it's on the 4th of January. I don't know if it'll be live or not, but with um, Adam Sanchez, 
I don't know if you know him. He's, um, I think one of his screen names is like yoga something or other, but Adam Sanchez, really cool guy. Um, he did a poll, uh, one or two of them on his, um, or not a poll, but he sort of like had a post. He asked a question and um, I responded to one of them and he kind of reached out to me and we, um, we established a bit of an interesting professional relationship. And then, um, you, you know, we talk about what it's like to be kind of, um, I'll just say LGBT, whatever you want to, that's acronym. Um, All those letters. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> if I could only tell you some of the, some of the stories, cause you know, in my twenties, I actually was an activist and I traveled around the country and I did what I thought I was supposed to be doing to help, um, people, uh, live happier lives and stuff. So I've, I've, I've done that sort of political thing back in the old days, but I tell you those number those letters just keep getting longer and longer. So, um, there is a part of the great awakening that is not just for, you know, I guess you could say, um, sort of the, the straight and narrow. But I think the Great Awakening is also really happening to members of, of, of that community as well, because we're recognizing um, that it's very convoluted, the, 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 this talking point. It, the, there's a lot to it. And that's what me and Adam are going to be talking about on July, on um, January 4th. So if you guys are interested in that conversation, because it'll, it'll, be, it'll be interesting, uh, feel free to check him out, Adam Sanchez. But Knowing what I know and living what I've lived, um, we all have challenges and we all have strengths and weaknesses in our life. But the more you can come into your own awakening from a human and spiritual and or extraterrestrial or whatever you want to call it perspective first, the rest is merely colors of your own can on your on your own canvas. Do you know what I mean? And they can be quite vivid, beautiful colors. They could be colors that many people haven't really seen in this in this visual spectrum here on Terra. You know, God God knows I I, I feel like that quite often. But um, but we're all um, we're all here to hopefully um, help each other. And for people who haven't quite got on that train yet, that we're all we're all here to help each other. Hopefully. Um, then, you know, maybe, maybe uh, there's more to the Great Awakening that needs to occur on a mass scale. But I tell you what, I'm an optimist and I'm, what I'm seeing is major change, man. So it takes one consciousness at a time to, to evolve into uh, uh, an evolved mass consciousness. So slow and steady wins the race. <laughs> yes, it is a slow process and you're absolutely right. And I will definitely have to check that out. And mm -hmm. uh, hey, if, He's an experiencer. Let him know, man. Send yeah. him my way on the show. I would love to have him on because I'm one of the few people that have really went out of my way to get people from all backgrounds. And, you know, I want everyone to know that I am a supporter of this community, not the political agenda behind it. But to me, I honestly don't care what a human being loves as long as they're loving something. Yeah. That's all that matters to me is the love and whether it's, you know, animals, this or that, it doesn't matter to me. And I just wanted to clear that up because unfortunately there's still old mentalities. Human beings still have a lot more to go in evolving. And it, like you said, we're painting our own canvas. You get to put the colors on it and you can choose to be upset of those that are over here on this level. Or you can choose to just keep doing you and keep yeah. raising that elevation, keep raising that vibration. And that's what it's all about. Now, one thing I do want to talk about a little bit more now in your second book. All right. Chronicles series. You know, I'm a character in there and I really want to talk about my character. But Good. I don't know what I'm allowed to legally say. Yeah. So. Daniel, can you tell everyone that's watching this in case they want to hear about a red bearded cowboy, uh, you know, a loose cannon character, uh, you want to fill that in to how I play a role with this gay couple in a mountain town building a star seed school, etc., and communicating with Octorians and many other wild things? How does a hillbilly like me get involved with all this? 
Uh, first of all, kudos to you for putting that pressure on me to answer that question. So good for you. That that's uh, I'll take that. I'll take that and run with it. My goodness. Um, so I was actually thinking while you were talking because you and I have had some really awesome conversations and the, the individuals that I've been lucky enough to have interviews with, I've just, I've established such wonderful relationships with. And I think that you actually really were one of the first people in the community. I think you were the first um, who you were open to um, having conversations with me and our conversations lasted many beautiful, awesome hours. And there are similarities. There are, um, a lot of commonalities in our stories, and um, and I love that you're one of the one of the great people in the community who who is constantly looking for the commonalities and the things that connect us rather than the things that divide us. So I'm thankful for that. So because you're such an inspiring person, and you're also a very uh, interesting character too, I would say you have. Your I'm own a real character. I'm a real <laughs> character. I'm a real character. <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, look at me on the cartoon. <laughs> but you have you have a you have a presence about you. And when I when I of course when I spoke to you, I uh, you know, I'm empathic and I feel things and, and whatever. But when I like met you physically at the conference, I was like, yo, this guy is um he's a cool cat. He is his own wonderful man. And I just couldn't um, deny that um, I was very thankful for our friendship and I was thankful for also our professional relationship. So I just thought to myself, who better to be an, a potential unlikely hero or, um, or someone who assists uh, people's process throughout the book, who, um, who may just be, um, you know. Rough around the edges. Rough around the edges. Very and rough. Even worse than what I actually am, but I love that. But it's usually the people who are rough around the edges that have the most interesting stories and the most interesting things to tell people because I don't really grab it. Yeah. I don't really gravitate uh, to, to people who kind of put more of like a, um, a way too polished perspective. It's, <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's not, it, it, I don't feel it as much. But for you, my friend, I um, I certainly feel uh, your your um, your charisma, your passion, your your fire, and your um, unpredictableness, but also your loyalty, and all of that is captured in your character in the book, and um, I'm very thankful for that. And uh, hopefully, I I gave a little dabble to the audience. Hopefully, that that's yeah. Enough. Okay, it, it comes through. I'm I'm pretty sure after people read this book, they're gonna like. He's a right winger. He's working for Trump. He believes in this Second Amendment. Whoa, he hates commies. <laughs> no, I, I, I loved it, dude. And uh, my character, you know, I didn't want to talk about it because I'm afraid it was so inspiring that this unlikely, unpolished, rough around the edges character that society would maybe kind of toss off to the side becomes as you said this unlikely hero mm. this a background character that you wouldn't expect anything out of but in the book a lot comes out of this character and this character is not what you think it is yes and, and leave it at that <laughs> i'm not saying another word after that but that's beautiful and i yep. believe that describes me Yes. And you know, it's interesting too. And uh, thank you for that. Um, I didn't know what I was writing. You know, again, I, I don't know if, if most writers are like this, but I just sat down and I, I just, I, I, I provided an environment with which I could live and breathe this world again, because for a very long time, my readers were like, Dan, you need to write book two. And I'm like, I know, but I'm working with my peeps. Got to make sure it's the right time. And once it was, I even actually did a Facebook um, uh, post about it. I'm like, I just got the okay from my guides. I'll be writing. I was starting writing tomorrow. Well, granted, it took double the time than it did for the first book. But, you know, I can't be mad at myself because um, maybe that actually gets me to an interesting topic of creativity where um, I feel as though constraints are actually important for creative people. And I don't mean chains to the wall. 
but I do mean constraints, challenges, those things that that force creative people to really hone their 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 not only their intuition but also their their the critical evaluation skills how would i get out of this situation how can i maybe make this situation um, much more prolific for all the characters now that's actually bringing me to talk a little bit about eva i don't want to talk too much but um charles's sister so, beautiful character and uh, that was dude i swear before you said that that was one character I wanted to talk about because she is the embodiment mm. of doubt. Mm. Having that hard time of under some of us, even when we see these things, we struggle with it, right? It doesn't mean we have all the answers. I don't want to, I want you to talk about Eva, but yes, Charles forthright, Dr. Charles forthright, his sister, her character, is so real dude and we all know people like this yeah i'm gonna give a little credence to my my editor and friend who did mention um around the fourth or fifth chapter i think she goes dan this is wonderful and i know where you're going but you need to have some conflict you and need to have the antagonist they call yeah. it the antagonist writing and rule number one yeah, and she's like, don't be afraid of conflict. Now, granted, I am an air sign, so if if I can see that conflict is, is not going very well, I'm like, gotta go. <laughs> Get out. But but there is, and you know, and I've learned this in my marriage, there is um I'm married to a Capricorn male, so very interesting, very sturdy man. Um, there is a lot of uh beauty that can exist in staying and working and deepening no matter how painful sometimes things can be um because you know in this decade almost decade of us uh, being together we actually um i did mention to you before the call that i, I had uh, some interesting uh, um, emotions that i was working on but we had a prolific conversation today my husband and i uh, we're both in north carolina right now we're we're um you know we were here for the holidays and stuff and I am just so thankful to have someone like him in my life that um, we've been able to get through a tremendous uh, challenges and struggles and also bear witness to some remarkable triumphs as well. But Eva can be perceived a little bit like my husband, my actual husband, um, because I love him, God knows, but no matter how much evidence you give this man, he ain't gonna believe nothing unless he has all these experts that he believes in to, to then quantify it and qualify it. But we're all different, right? We're all different. We need all different types of people in this world. So there's been a lot of headaches, of course, but my goodness, like the appreciation I have for this man um, is is just really, off the charts. So I had to, I had to sit and be with the conflict that was, that was going on with Eva, even when it was a little uncomfortable, because that's her story. And that's a story that many people have. And so who would I be as an author or a human being or whatever, <laughs> if I didn't bring that story to life in this whole environment where oftentimes things that are very otherworldly are happening. So, yeah. And we, we all have an Eva character. The main character, sister, we all have this character in our life. And these characters are even within these communities, people mm -hmm. that even if they physically see these things, <laughs> yeah. and an important part of her character is trauma. Yeah. And mm -hmm. because of that past trauma, even though she is coming to these evidence now, where most of us, that same evidence would woo, send us through the roof, we'd be on another planet. Because of that past trauma with her character, it doesn't go the way. I love that the book actually ends and not everything is resolved with her you know this is a lifetime experience that we are all going through and even though i'm kind of pinning eva mm. character on everyone else but there is a part of you and i 
and Eva as well. And oh, yeah. everyone that will end up reading this, Eva is kind of our, you know, overly logical brain. Mm. You know, we all have a bit of her in there. And mm. sometimes to come to these conclusions, speaking outside the book, but just the fact of extraterrestrials are real, they've always been around and we're connected with the universe. That's a lot for any sane mind to process after a sane mind has been preconditioned to not think that way. Yes. It's a lot to comprehend. Yeah, she, she tends to be uh, the critic. And um, we all kind of, you know, need that. And I guess that, that harkens back to my point about creativity where, you know, creativity is fantastic and awesome. But if we didn't have certain constraints, we wouldn't have the impetus to keep going. You know, we would just create and just float away on our little, pretty little clouds. But uh, you need those grounding sources. And Eva was that, uh, and is that, <laughs> I guess you could say, for um, the character, for the family. Uh, she's, she's, she's tough. And, yeah. you know, there are certain people that I take the characters and I take little parts of people that I know. And so yeah, he's not, she's not totally my husband. She's also someone else in my life too. But yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it shows, and uh, it's amazing, amazing book, man, and so inspired, and well, some of the parables and some of the lessons that are taught at this Star Seas Academy, uh, you know, it, it's absolutely amazing, and it really brings uh, a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. The corrections, you know, this book is a lot about the education system mm -hmm. and how it's absolutely wrong. Am I right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good point. And it also, uh, because I really care very deeply about grounding uh, the story for people, uh, it does talk about things that we're dealing with in everyday life, especially nowadays. Uh, what happens um, after people start learning that the world, the country, politics, religion, everything isn't exactly what we we um, have been told it is. So what do we do about that in, in, in the aftermath? Um, yeah, what, what do you do after you get fired from your life career for not taking one of these? What do you, where do you go from there? What do you do for your children and yep. your loved ones when you've just been ousted out of the community for a personal health decision where do you go? Yep. What do you do? Uh, it's interesting you bring that up because um, slight, slight um, disclaimer. Um, that is that is the reason why I um, I had to leave my my job in education because I I didn't. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, uh, that was brought up too because I, I've seen it with my own eyes, even as an observer in this wonderful world. And, um, countless, countless people, countless testimonies of wonderful, intelligent, amazing, loving, wonderful people completely lost their jobs. You know, and now, granted, we all know about 2020 to 2022 and all the lockdowns and everything. Um, you know, I had a business in San Francisco. I had to close it because of all the stuff and um, I had to move and la la la. So all of us uh, are, are, are finding ways to make things work. And that's what this second book is about. What do you do when you, you don't want to uh, have certain medical procedures that you don't agree with? and you lose your job or you get kicked out of school or you, your kids get kicked out of school uh are there alternatives well i'm here to tell you there are alternatives whether you have to make it yourself or connect to friends who are gonna do it too or you get online you do your research you find answers you keep going you keep going because that's what the the human the human nature is all about keep on going and that sums up the, the book very, very well. What do you do when all other resources let you down? And I got news for, you know, all the people that have had to suffer because they haven't had the, you know, little pokey thing. You know, guess what? All those people without that little thing, they're all going to get together and figure it out. There you go. <laughs> it is what it is. And not just, you know, the pokey thing, a lot of other situations as well. 
not just health issues, political values, different ideologies, believing in aliens versus not believing in them, spirituality, different religious beliefs, different, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but racism is actually still a thing. <laughs> I, I don't understand what racism is, but apparently amongst humans and things like that, uh, that still exists. People are, you know, I'm so busy thinking on beings that are manifested of light in a seventh or eighth density mm. that I can't even comprehend looking at a human being with a different skin tone as anything uh, other than but what I am. Yeah. When I'm so focused on beings that look like giant reptilian dragons and giant blue and purple Andromedan beings and cat-like species. The last thing I'm worried about is a human having a slightly different skin color than mine. Yeah. No, we're, we're all in this together. And, you know, that, that over common, you know, in, in the book, the most beautiful thing is all of these different characters all kind of meeting on that level, all come coming to a common ground and just doing what they need to do. Yeah. And these parents wanting uh, an education for their children, but yeah. an education and what you do so well in this book, and it's important, one last little note, is the education system right now. It's only set up to meet about 25% of the students that are involved with that curriculum. 75% mm -hmm. of children that are within the school education systems, it's not set up to meet their needs. It's only set up to reach a very small fraction. Mm -hmm. And I believe that our current education system is set up for such a small fraction of students that that other 75% whether it's people like you and I and so many others and people watching this that set it up. I have so many mutual friends and people I know that do homeschooling mm -hmm. where they've taken it. I encourage everyone watching this. If you're a parent, do the homeschooling yourself. You know, um, it's more work and you might not be able to, but you know, that that's where we're at. We yeah. got to do this ourselves because the education system, just like the healthcare system, just like the political system, just like the military complex system, <laughs> they have all failed us. All of it. Yeah. So do it ourselves. Yeah. This book can inspire anyone, regardless of where you come from, where you live, what you believe sexual preference, political views, you can overcome and you can be the change you want to see in this world. That's it. It's beautiful. Universal, you know, love. That's what the book is about. Yeah. You know, especially with your encounters. And we're not talking about because we want people to be surprised, mm -hmm. but there's some like deep off world stuff that goes down. And the professor's father is involved with some oh, really, really deep stuff there in book one and book two. So uh, you definitely have to check it out. And uh, for everyone that's watching this now, if you want to find more about my character, I promise you, Daniel did a wonderful job. And my character will leave you uh, laughing, shocked, and much, much more in there. Uh, because if you do know me, you know he ain't kidding. It's pretty accurate. So, uh, yeah, man. Uh, everyone that's watching this, if you go in the description, you can actually find a link for both book one and book two of Daniel's Chronicles series absolutely incredible all inspiring books please make sure you check them out there is a kindle version and a paperback uh you know me i prefer the paper i'm all about the paper i like the oh i like to hold it in my hands and slap my head with it <laughs> <laughs> but uh absolutely phenomenal book and truly daniel it's absolutely inspired me and for anyone that's watching if uh, daniel like i said he's came on in the past episode 19 of we are the, the disclosure you can go through and find that 
I'll actually put a link to his first interview where he really goes over his personal experiences. And we talk a little bit about the book because the book was just coming out. Mm -hmm. So th this is a round <laughs> two and all that. And um, pleasure to have you on, brother. And if you would, you know, close out final thoughts, uh, ways for people to reach you up and coming projects, et cetera. And uh, yeah, let everyone know what's up. Yeah. So just like the first book, um, I, we, I, we set up the second book, right? Uh, yeah. There's a bit of a setup. Same setup here for the second book. We are working, we're going to be working on the trilogy, the, the third part of the book very soon. And um, I am doing some collaborations. Um, uh, I don't know how much I can say, but um, I'm very interested in, um, I'm going to be doing a, a nonfiction uh, story book um, about someone that we might know. About me? <laughs> okay, fine, about you. Um, uh, but we'll be doing. So, we'll be doing... Let, let, let's go ahead and say, <laughs> I, I don't care. So uh, everyone out there, I will be writing a book about my family's experience mm. and my life experiences, everything, things I've never said on YouTube, and I probably won't even after the book is published. I'm not that kind of person. But yeah, Daniel's going to be helping me. He's going to be writing the book. We're going to be working together, and it's going to be an amazing book. So yeah, go ahead and say it. Why not? <laughs> they still got to read it. <laughs> yeah, and um, I'm I'm actually lucky enough. There's um I think there's a few other people kind of in the community who are interested in in, in doing things as well. You know, uh, someone uh, well that we know, um, a potential trilogy. Uh, also, to a few other people who simply just want to get their stuff out and don't really know how to self-publish. It is certainly an education, and I would highly recommend if anyone wants to self-publish that they really talk to someone who who has been there because it can save you a tremendous amount of headache there's reasons i say this very often that i don't have hair not only just biologically but i think a lot i i struggle a lot i um i want to get you know the the most truth i can i want to get there um spending hopefully as le least amount of money as possible you know being budget conscious and i know how to do that so i'm happy to help anyone because uh all of our voices need to be heard and um, i'm very thankful for this opportunity yeah, and I, I cannot wait. And uh, since the cat's out the bag, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, the book is going to be really powerful, really in the depth. And people are going to hear a side of my story that I've never really shared publicly. Because in this book, mm -hmm. it's not just about a UFO crash and my mother being abducted by aliens and being in the hybrid program. It's what's my connection with all of this. Mm. And there will be new information set in the book about a lot of things going on in the disclosure community. It will only be in this book and it will only be said in this book and never on YouTube. So I guarantee you this book is going to clear the air and all of you out there that are hating, manipulating and perpetrating, you better watch out because when this book comes out, all of your narratives are going to be blown to smithereens because sometimes, you know, the truth is stranger than fiction. And uh, people can make up fantastical stories, but the truth is untouchable. And evidence speaks for itself. And it's going to be a book of no other. I'm so happy you're helping me out with that. And Daniel's going to make sure that this story is told the way it needs to be told where I have a really hard time doing that. I, I'm a video creator. Like you said, it takes a lot of work. I realize how much work it takes. I pull, I, I lose all my hair from doing YouTube videos. You lose all your hair from write, writing right. books. So like, you know, <laughs> together we can do great things. Uh, but yes, yeah, so um, you got a lot of other projects going on and these books are uh, available. Is there anything else uh, you're working on at the moment? You know, there always is. Uh, by, I was I did an interview with um, Sherry Divband and she made this kind of joke. She's awesome, isn't she? She made this kind of joke. She's like, um, so, you know, kind of we're talking about what next we have in line and stuff. And I forget exactly what I said, but I was um, she guess she said, oh, yeah, with that free time you have. Right. Um, <laughs> true. 
<laughs> so um, I guess I can't think right off the bat, um, but oh, I will actually be doing a little bit with um, the Aramis School uh, with Sherry Dipman. Oh! So, teach some stuff. So isn't that interesting how this book is about uh, Starseed Academy and then now I'll be doing some stuff with Sherry, so. Which is a physical version of pretty much what's in the book. Yeah. Yep. It's kind of like the blueprint print going on there and uh yeah it's great and she's someone i really uh look forward to having on i'm not worried about it i was just talking to a few other mutual friends and stuff and i'm like ah, I'll be, we'll, we'll get in contact when we get in contact i just stopped trying a long time ago i just let the universe just ride with it and it'll happen when it happens but yeah, man, this book, it's really all about the children. It's about love. It's about, you know, just what's the next step? Once we know these things exist and they're real, which most of us already do, you know, we're not going to need the Mutual UFO Network and History Channel and Skinwalker Ranch and Ancient Aliens telling us what we already need to know. What's the next step? to human evolution and the consciousness and the acceptance of us being one with the universe. Where do we go from there? That's this book. It's not a book talking about the amazing uh, discoveries and revelations that will come from connecting with our galactic families. It's the revelations that comes from someone that's already connected. And where do we go from here on for humanity? And that's a beautiful message that is untouchable. And I'm going to say it. This is my favorite book. Second favorite book. I, I mm. This is technically my first one. I got to be, I'm being completely honest. But this is my second favorite book. And I know I'm in there. So I might be being a little biased, but I don't care. I loved it. It was really relatable. I felt like I was in the book. <laughs> I was. Yeah, you so were. I, I, I can't help it, but um, the message, if you were to remove my character out the book, uh, it's still absolutely very powerful. And the first book, very, very powerful as well. And unlike a lot of trilogies, your trilogy is going up. It, it's a, you know, crescendo. All right, let, let's, let's speak in your, your singing terminology. It's going up. And I know that third book is going to be an octave so high that it's completely out of this dimension. I That's know it. it's coming. That's interesting perspective, right? What you just said right there could be out of this dimension and or world. We'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. But Daniel, thank you so much, brother. Much love. And uh, thank you for all the work you're doing and everything this book represents. It's such a powerful book that's representing so many different ideas, so many different philosophies, so, so many different educations and just mm. everything. It's uh, so inspiring. And it's really inspired me personally. I'm not going to get too much into it. We've talked privately, but uh, expect me to be doing a lot more for children in the future. And Trust me, I know I'm the least person you would expect, but if most of you knew my education and what I went to university for, it would not surprise you. But this book has kind of inspired and has awakened something I've lost in me a long time ago. And just seeing that a uh, character like me still has a place mm -hmm. on this earth to help others I hope that will inspire all of you that are watching right now. Listen to this. There is a plan for you. And you are valuable. And you can make a difference. Regardless of how unperfect you are or rough around the edges you can be. You can make a difference. And that is the main message that i took away from this book and i know all of you will resonate with that as well so go into the description make sure you check it out buy both copies and get get the paperbacks trust me you'll enjoy it a lot more kindle's cool 
I mean, Daniel won't mind if you buy the Kindle. He will not complain at all. But it's nice to have that paperback. And especially once all three are out, you'll get to have a nice little trilogy. Maybe you'll make a triple pack. Who knows for the trilogy? And um, I will actually be at the Journey to Truth conference. Um, I will be selling books and giving readings. So I will sign your book if you'd like to come over if you've already bought it. So Yes, I will be there too, buddy. Uh, we're, <laughs> we'll, we'll be hanging out, staying in the same fancy place. Uh, that will be May 22nd through the 25th Grafton, Illinois Journey to Truth conference with uh, Aaron and Tyler. That's going to be a blast, dude. I, I can't wait. And uh, yeah, I'll... I guess I'll have to bring these, but I'll, I'll see you. I'll get them signed. But okay. if you do purchase it and all of you that are watching, you're coming to the conference, bring the books along and have Dan sign them or you can purchase them there. You will be selling the books along with other things there as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. So, yeah, everyone, thank you once again. Please hit that like button. Please subscribe to the channel and keep a lookout for up and coming videos. Make sure you check out Dr. Dan Seda. Check out his Facebook. I'll have his email, all that good stuff in there and a link to the books in the description. So if you want to reach out to him and chat with him, I'm sure he would love to have a talk with you. So I will see you all next time. This is a new era of contact. We're way past disclosure. Disclosure's old news, dude. It's happening. We're making it happen. It's just a new era of contact. It's already done. And that's what we're doing. So this is Robert Earl White, Dr. Dan Seda. Much love to you all. And we'll see you next time. Have a great night, everyone. See you later. Bye. <laughs> Please join the YouTube membership for my channel. You will get exclusive badges, really awesome emojis, member only live streams, posts, and chats, and connections with me for only $5.99 a month. See you there. Hey everyone, check out the Order of Light merchandise store. We got a lot of different t shirts there. The Humans Aren't Real, Lower Always Creek Incident. We got tank tops and Merkaba. We got stickers, glasses, a lot of different glasses. So get thirsty. We got bags. I live in New Jersey. We don't have bags anymore. So it's really nice. We got flip flops, hoodies, and all the ladies out there. We got a bunch of awesome merchandise for you.